So now we're at a really important point where we know exactly what DNA looks like, we know how DNA copies itself, but what we don't know is how it actually works. And that's what we want to focus on here. Uh, as we said, we know exactly that it's a double helix, we know that we find it in the nucleus, we know exactly that it does hold a genetic code, and we even know where that code is found. Remember, in our bases, A's, T's, C's, and G's. But, big but, how the heck does it actually work? How do those bases and those code instructions tell me to have blue eyes, or tell me to have a butt chin, or tell me to have cystic fibrosis, unfortunately? That's what we want to look at. Because remember, ultimately, all DNA is, we say that it's genes and it's instructions, but really, it's instructions on how to make proteins, which we've talked a great deal about in this class so far throughout the year. So when we say it's actually a gene to give you blue eyes, really, it's a gene to make a protein or series of proteins that will, in turn, give us blue eyes. And that's a distinct difference something we want to really uh, get to the bottom of and figure out. So remember that really all proteins are are a bunch of amino acids stuck together to make a polypeptide. Long chains of amino acids. We take one, stick it to another one, stick it to another one. So in essence when we say proteins we're really just saying polypeptides. Long, long chains of amino acids. So really, if we could think about what a protein actually looks like, it's simply this long chain. Each one of these small circles would be an amino acid that is bent and folded and curved and twisted to form a specific three-dimensional protein. That might be structural, it may be an enzyme, it could be pigments, they could be hormones, it could be almost anything. So what we want to focus on here is that this is going to be a pretty complicated process to go from a code to an actual protein. It's going to require, as I said here, a lot of players. Now this sheet is something I've made up that you're going to be getting later on, but what we're going to do throughout this process is uh, use, to, to borrow a, a phrase from English teachers, uh, in metaphors that, or in this case a simile, that building a protein is just like building a house. And we're going to try to take each one of our individual molecules and components and players, if you will, and compare that to a certain person, place, or structure in building a house. And I think that will really help us understand the process. So if we want to focus on its function and how it works, we're going to have to look at some of those players in, in particular. How do we go from that gene that's just a segment of DNA to getting our finished product, an actual protein? And it can be complicated, but really it's a two-part play. So, so many times what you'll hear uh, individual teachers say are weird things like this transcription and translation. Many times it'll be abbreviated as TNT. But really this process of transcription and translation is how we actually go from a gene to a protein. We're going to transcribe, or transcription or copy the gene, and then translate that into an actual protein that we can build. So that's what our focus is going to be on here. We're going to focus today just on, with this video, transcription, part one. So when we say that it's a two uh, series of events, a two-part play, the first part where we're going to focus on transcription. Now a scribe or scription just means to write or to copy. So in this process, it's pretty simple. It's going to be very much like DNA replication, but not the same. We're going to take that code that's hidden in DNA and copy it onto a different molecule called messenger RNA. Now that's not DNA, that's like a cousin of DNA that we'll look at, uh, RNA ribonucleic acid. And the fact that it's called messenger RNA is just uh, a nice name because it's actually this molecule's job is just going to be to carry a message. It's going to be like a messenger, delivering a message from one place to another. And in a later video, we'll look at translation. That's the second part where we'll actually build the protein, but don't worry about this part for now. Right now, we want to focus on just transcription. But before we can do that, we just want to take a look at what, as I've called here, this cousin of DNA is, RNA. It's very much like DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, except it's ribonucleic acid. It's chemically and structurally a little bit different. Um, so let's just look at how it's different and see if you can figure out, again, we're focusing just on messenger RNA here, how these RNA molecules are different. 
So DNA is over here on this side, RNA is on this side. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pause the video for a second and take a look at them and see if you can find there are three key differences. So go ahead and pause it, see if you can jot down what those differences are. All set? Good, I hope you got the three. Probably the most obvious is right down here, the fact that, as we've seen, DNA is a ladder, a double helix. We can see our rungs here, which we've built, with our sugars and phosphates on the outside. Notice RNA is single-stranded. It's only one strand, not double-stranded. Another difference, if we jump back up here, is that DNA has a phosphate, sugar, and a base. So does RNA, phosphate, sugar, and a base. But the sugars are different. It doesn't really look too different. Structurally, it's, well, it's slightly different uh, in the fact that one little thing here, it's got an extra oxygen. This guy's missing an oxygen, hence deoxyribose. But perhaps for us, the most important difference is right here. Our bases that hold the code that make up DNA's instructions, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Notice that RNA has four bases also, adenine, guanine, cytosine, but instead of thymine, it has a different chemical called uracil. Still is a single base here. Still is, is actually, we can think of, if you notice the shape-wise here, it's going to take the place of thymine, if you will, for now. So I want to focus on those three differences, and, and those are important. We want to keep them in mind. So let's just take a look at this process, and the good news is, is that it's going to be really, really simple. All we're going to do is take the coded instructions on DNA and copy them, kind of, onto a single-stranded mRNA molecule. In other words, in this picture, these blue strands are our DNA. Notice that it's been unzipped here. And just like, just like with DNA replication, a big enzyme, notice this RNA polymerase, should sound somewhat familiar, instead of bringing in opposite bases that are complementary A's, C's, G's, and T's, this guy's bringing in opposite bases. Notice the uracils. So what it's going to do is not build an exact copy of DNA. It's going to build an opposite complementary set of bases right here. And another distinction is we're not going to copy the whole DNA. We're only copying one gene, one set of instructions. So it might be important here for us to note that uh, just to make a, a slight distinction here that uh, so far we learned that if DNA goes and makes an exact copy of itself, DNA making more DNA, we would call that process replication. We've already learned that. But what we're focusing on here is what do we do when DNA uses instructions to make messenger, that little M here denoting messenger, RNA. That process is transcription. So that's what we want to do. What are the steps of transcription? And the good news is, it's actually pretty darn simple. It'll be very, very much like DNA replication. So let's take a look at what it actually looks like. So it's three steps. And the first step, all we do, this enzyme RNA polymerase binds to DNA at what's called a promoter region. So if we look at that, here's our DNA, which you guys have built. This is our gene right here, the spot that has our instructions that we want. Somehow in here, that's telling us to build a protein. So this big piece of chewed up gum looking thing, this enzyme, RNA polymerase, binds to a promoter. Think of that as a neon flashing sign saying, hey, right here, bind right here. This is where you want to copy everything downstream. So it locks into place here at the promoter region and begins untwisting and unraveling our DNA so it can get at the good stuff inside. So there's step one we bind RNA polymerase binds. In step two, it zips down along that gene and it simply brings in and attaches new opposite complementary bases. So on the outside here and right here are our DNA strands. This is our template DNA. This is our gene we want to copy. Notice that this pink guy is our RNA polymerase that it's zipping along, you can see it already brought in a C opposite a G, an A opposite a T, a G opposite a C, a U opposite an A. And currently, real time, what he's done is these all these bases are opposite, bonding together, complementary hydrogen bond attraction. One difference, though, remember, it is single-stranded, and anywhere there's a C in DNA, it brings in a G. Anywhere there's a G, it brings in a C. Anywhere there's a T, it brings in an A. But notice right here, remember, 
if there's an adenine in the DNA, our RNA does not contain thymine. It brings in a uracil. So that's going to be a dead giveaway as to whether you're one of the ways to tell if you're looking at DNA or RNA. So that process continues and zips along. We make a copy of the gene until we get to the very end of the gene after we've copied that. Here it is zipping along. This little red tail is our uh, mRNA, which is an opposite copy of the gene. When we're finished with the gene, notice everything releases. Our polymerase goes away. Our DNA is zipped shut again. And there is our copy, our blueprint, if you will, of the gene. Pretty simple. So now we just want to end with a short video so you can actually see transcription uh, in real time. But before we do that, just to very, very quickly um, re-emphasize again that if our, let's say, I suppose our DNA short little ladder here had bases such as A, T, G, G, C, and A. If we were to copy that, if we were to make a messenger mRNA, that would be unzipped and opened up, and our polymerase would bring in which bases? Take a second to pause that and think about which ones you would be seeing. And we could then try to figure out what the bases are. So go ahead, take a second, see if you can figure out what they would be. Hopefully you paused it and you realized that you would have in our mRNA U, A, C, C, G, and U. Now notice these letters up here, our mRNA, aren't exactly the same as the DNA, but they're opposite bases. We've just copied our code into a slightly different format. So let's go ahead and take a, end by taking a look at this final video so you can watch it uh, in action. So there's our DNA molecule. Notice that it is double helix. We can see our bases through here. Notice in the background all of this garbage. These are our loose nucleotides here. So we've unzipped. We've opened up. And here are our opposite complementary bases. Notice them coming in in C's with G's. However, in our RNA, if our DNA was A, G, C, T, A, A, C, C, G, our RNA, as we said, would be opposite. U, C, G, A, U, U, G, G, C. And that's it. mRNA leaves. Our DNA zips back shut, and our mRNA, which is a copy of that code, those instructions, can now leave, here's our nucleus, and go out to where it needs to be. Simple enough.